Welcome back for another episode of the Happy at Work podcast with Laura, Tessa, and Michael. Each week, we have thoughtful conversations with leaders, founders, and authors about happiness at work. Tune in each Thursday for a new conversation. Enjoy the show. Welcome to the Happy at Work podcast, and I'd like to welcome our guest today, Andrew Soren, who is the founder of Eudaimonic by Design. Welcome, Andrew. Thank you, Michael. So nice to be here. Excellent. Laura, would you like to start us off? Absolutely. I'm so excited to talk with you, Andrew. So let's start first by just telling us where did the name of your business come from, Eudaimonic by Design? It's usually the first question that people tend to ask me. Uh, <laughs> Uh, eudaimonia, eudaimonia, eudaimonia is this wonderful ancient word that, um, that basically has no translation, which is the reason why I, I stick with this impossible word for, for the name of a company. But, um, according to the ancient Greeks, um, eudaimonia was one way of thinking about, about well-being, but it is a, it's a very specific way of thinking about well-being. It's, it's a way of thinking about what a life well-lived would actually be. And so, um, according to Aristotle, um, he would say that a life well lived was that every day, kind of, you worked your ass off to try to bring the very best of yourself to do something in the important in the world. Um, that would be like my interpretation of much more heady language. But um, but that that notion of of trying to figure out like what's the right thing to do in this particular situation which is an incredibly complex thing, especially in our world, to try to figure out what's, how do I go about bringing the best of myself to achieve things that are important to me, um, to potentially do something that would be virtuous, you could even say. Um, it's a way of thinking about well-being that's rooted in ethics. Um, it's about being really fully engaged and about trying to be the most excellent form of yourself that you possibly can. And uh, and this idea of eudaimonia has been one of the ways that people have talked about well-being for millennia. And um, and there's variations of the concept that exist in all sorts of different cultures all around the world. Um, I'm based in Canada, and there's a whole bunch of different First Nations, Indigenous peoples in Canada who have a whole lot of very similar ideas about what a life well-lived is. Um, and that's true kind of everywhere um, that you look. But this, this, th- this notion that from an organizational perspective, you know, probably work would be way better if we could find a way to design it to allow us to bring the very best of ourselves to do important work. And so that's basically what eudaimonic by design is. How do we design a company to allow people to be their most eudaimonic selves? Awesome. I love it. So I, I'm really actually um fascinated by the the origin of the word because my son who just graduated from high st- high school took uh three years of greek and four years of latin so i'm going to quiz him when he comes home from nice, work nice. it's good. Um, i'm hoping that he has shares a, a similar philosophy as he heads off to college but you know you talked about well-being in the context of bringing your best self right every day to whatever it is that you, the impact you want to make on the world and you know, tell us a little bit about what does well-being mean for your clients and how do you work with them uh, around the concept of well-being? Yeah, it's a it's a really great question. And I should I should give a little forewarning that everything that I talk about when it comes to well-being, including all these ideas around eudaimonia, um, not only are they kind of anchored in, in, in philosophy, but they're very much based on psychology. So um, the reason that I the reason that I know Michael is that both of us went through the University of Pennsylvania's Master of Applied Positive Psychology program, and that's actually where I started to learn about the idea of eudaimonia. And so um, and so when I think about well being, um, I'm really thinking about it from that psychological perspective. Um, and and it's a it's a really it's a, it's a really interesting thing because within psychology there actually isn't a singular definition of what well-being is. And I think the thing that about that that is so interesting is that in the real world, um, in the work that I do with clients, no two clients that I've ever worked with have the exact same definition of what well-being means. And I think that that's actually a really 
an important part of what it means to do work around well-being in organizations is actually trying to figure out how do you define something that everyone thinks that they know what it means, but when you actually dig a little bit, nobody knows what it means. Like I, I have this, um, I have this colleague, her name is Mo McKenna, and she talks about the fact that there's some words in the world that are common sense words, which basically just means that everyone assumes that they know what that means. I think well-being is a perfect example. But common sense words require being made sense of as a commons she would say. And that that work of actually even defining what well-being means in an organizational context is, I think, a really part, uh, important part of certainly everything that I do with the clients that I work with. Andrew, I love how you, how you explain that with well-being because I have run into several people where it's clear they have a different definition for themselves. And the last person we had on the show was the CEO of Rico. And he was really, really focused on well-being and mental health. And he probably has his own definition as well. And I'm, I'm curious, since it's such a hot word now in the workplace, can you share with us what you see at the intersection of well-being and mental health in relationship to the workplace? Yeah, I think it's it's such an it's such a useful question to be able to ask right now. I think that well, certainly with within a psychological perspective, um, and even if you think about the origins of psychology, kind of way back to the to the nineteenth century, um, you see the way that people thought about well being as being kind of like a continuum. Like at one end of the continuum, you are ill. Um, or sick. At the other end of the continuum, you might be thriving or flourishing. And somewhere in the middle, everyone was just trying to get by, right? Like that's, that's kind of, and it was probably a fairly normal distribution curve where like few people were really like flourishing and a few people were really sick. And most of us were somewhere in that middle. And I think that as, as the field of um, positive psychology has emerged over the last 20, 30 years, I think that one of the biggest things that has actually come to be understood is that it's actually not that linear. It's not a line. It might be more like a two by two, um, where you have kind of well-being as one axis and you have mental illness as another axis. So you could kind of think about mental health versus mental illness. And those two things are not the same. And in fact, both of those things could be potentially at play in the exact same moment. And the guy who does, who's done a lot of this thinking, his name is Corey Keyes. And so he would say that like, if I have very high well-being, and very low mental illness, I'm probably in that flourishing category. Um, and if I have very low well-being and very high mental illness, I'm probably really struggling. But those aren't the only two options. I could be having really low well-being and low mental illness. There's nothing fundamentally wrong with me. But there's also fundamentally nothing going great either, which I think is how most people, at least in a certain part of the pandemic, really felt. Like we had these words like languishing, which is actually the word that Corey Keyes used, that start to emerge as, a, as like a word that everyone was suddenly starting to talk about, where they just felt like blah, right? That was probably actually about 45% of the population, according to some of the studies. Um, but then you also have this situation where people were really encountering an immense amount of struggle in their lives, whether it was about loneliness or depression or anxiety. Um, and those things were real, but they were also having the kind of skills that allowed them to thrive in spite of those things. So they were kind of struggling. They were thriving in the context of struggle. And that's I think a really interesting place. And in fact, when you look at the statistics during um, the pandemic, the vast majority of people are actually there. Very few are thriving. Very few are actually really, really, really struggling. Although those numbers have certainly increased. A lot of people are in kind of those opposite squares of the two by two. That's really cool. The way you just described that, Andrew, thank you for that. Um, so I've been kind of a student of well-being for a long time in the in this space and in organizations to me it's been fascinating to see how kind of the construct has evolved over time and I still I still sort of have this like cringy feeling whenever I, somebody interchanges wellness for well-being because in my head wellness is like this old school punitive like go you know go lose weight go stop smoking stuff um and 
you know, I think sometimes I get a little reactive when I see that word, <laughs> when it's really, to me, talking about well-being. But I think it's actually wonderful to see how it's evolved, right? Like that we are in much more of a place of thinking about people as whole people, not just how much they weigh, <laughs> or, you know, really what's happening up here. So I'd, I'd love to hear more of your thoughts around how have you seen this idea of well-being really evolve over time? Yeah, evolve is totally the right word for this. Um, I think that at the very beginning of the focus on well-being in organizations, a lot of it was about health and safety. When we talked about well-being or wellness, um, really what we were talking about is safety. Like, are, are we are we keeping people alive first and foremost? Are we keeping people relatively healthy? I think um, over the last decade, we've seen a huge emergence of things like psychological safety. Um, I think all of that perspective on what does it mean to focus on well-being in an organization was really about how do we prevent really bad things? Right? Like that's that's really what that first tier of, uh, and it's important. Like, I mean, you cannot, there's all, all the statistics um, are, say that you are not going to experience well-being um, if those fundamental things around safety and security are not in place. And so it is important and a fundamental element of why evolution kind of makes sense. It's like, yeah, we all need that. I think the next level of well-being, kind of tier two, um, is that um, uh, fruit, fitness, and flu shots approach. I think that's exactly what you're talking about from the wellness perspective, right? It's like, how do we make sure that there's like fruit bowls in the in like the in the kitchen? How do we make sure that we have walking programs so that we're getting people kind of like not just sitting in their chairs? You know, maybe we're thinking about sleep and helping people think better around sleep. We're making sure that people are vaccinated. You know, all of those things um, become a really kind of integral part. Which again, those are like our bodies are our vessels. If our bodies aren't there, we we can't do anything else. So kind of that physical wellness is important. I think the more recent evolution is into thinking about whole like whole person wellness. Can you, you said that too. And I think that this is this is really where positives like things like positive psychology have become so incredibly useful for us to think about the psychological elements of well-being, the the social elements of well-being, maybe even the spiritual elements that exist of well-being and how those things connect to our work. And maybe even how we can start to think about us as people beyond the workplace. Like what about the rest of our families? What about everything else that's important to us in our lives? How do we, how do we make space at work for those things? And don't just think of, you know, our, our, our human resources as resources, but think about them a little bit more as humans. Um, I think that the fourth um, wave the fourth piece in that evolution, which uh, which is really the the piece that I get most excited about, is about rethinking the employee experience from the perspective of well being, and so that means like really redesigning the way that our organizations work if the thing that's important to us is well being. So, like, how do you expect people to have well being? Um, if you don't actually create the context where they can get away from their job at the end of the day, like what do you as an organization do to create this space where somebody can actually have a reasonable amount of workload? How do you make sure that you're paying people enough so that they feel like their compensation is actually fair? Um, how do you think about something like performance management, which what all of us need to do if what you were really trying to do was think about eudaimonia? And like if if you were to think about the, a performance management program that you've gone through, could you say that 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 annual review process helps you harness the very best of yourself to do important work in the world? Probably not. So how would you need to literally blow up some of those you know really important processes in the employee experience life cycle from the lens of well-being? And I think that's where the future is. I love that evolution that you just talked about as, as those four different components. And I, um, I, I just actually started working with uh, Corn Ferry International and it's, it's, it's about how do you maximize performance with people, right? In teams and organizations. And I, I love that you're uh, taking that perspective around looking at well-being uh, through the lens of 
of performance um, of an organization and of teams. So the question I have for you then is how do organizations actually implement these ideas and make them stick? Because I think for a lot of, I know for me personally, I, I always have aspirations to have these habits and, and to create new habits and meditate every day and do all the good things that promote my own well-being. But it's hard to it's hard to follow through. It's hard to make it stick. I'm sure it's even harder for large organizations. So what what would your suggestions be on that? It's the right question to ask. And it's the hardest question. And I wish I could say, oh, there's a silver bullet. All you need to do is these three simple things. But it's not, it, it's impossible. Like that's that's kind of the point of eudaimonia is that, um, is that it's a daily practice. Like this is stuff that you actually have to work on every single day. And the context is constantly changing. The, the realities of what the organization needs, what your customers need, what your employee base needs, what all the stakeholders that you're trying to serve with our planet needs, those things are evolving and changing and figuring out what's the right thing to do today is a complex thing that there's no simple answer for. Um, which means that if you want some of these ideas to stick, I think that it starts with leadership. I think it's impossible to do this work if the people who hold positions of power in the organization don't believe that the answer is fundamentally their people. And I think that this is something that we saw really clearly um, through the pandemic. In some ways, I think this was the biggest gift that the pandemic gave us, was that it helped so many leaders understand that if they didn't think about the well-being of their people, they actually had nothing. And so I think that that has helped light a fire for people to understand that they have to think differently, as I said, about the humans who work in their organizations, not just the resources um, who are there to be able to help them achieve. So that's definitely number one, is um, is leaderships, leadership having the right mindset. And if you have the right mindset, then that probably means you're making decisions as an organization at all levels, strategic decisions especially, um, and you're looking at behavior from a different lens. And so I think that that means that you're living your values, you're walking your talk, right? Like that, that becomes a massive thing, which means that all the people who are responsible for the kinds of systems and programs that run our organizations, um, all of those people need to actually think, how am I doing these things in a different way to support well being as an outcome? You know, I talked about performance management, but you could take any aspect of the employee life cycle, whether it's how do I hire someone? How do I compensate someone? How do I promote someone? How do I fire someone? What happens once someone's left my organization? And if you looked at that process through the lens of well-being, if that was an important value that you were holding, you'd probably choose to do something different. So I think the first answer is like leadership needs to think from a different mindset perspective. Two is you need to really look at the artifacts, the way that the organization is governed and make sure that those things actually help you and not hinder you. And then the third would just be to say, this is an everyone challenge. Like everyone in your organization needs to get involved. This is an opportunity for empowerment. So that means thinking about culture in a different way. How do you create cultures of teams? How do you create climates within small groups of people? How do you think about the relationships between managers and employees with employees amongst themselves um, in a way that empowers them to make well-being a priority? I think if you can do those three things, if you can kind of make sure that the mindsets of leaders are in the right way, if you have the artifacts and structures in place, and if you create an empowering culture that allows people to own this, that's the only way to make it stick. This is great guidance, uh, Andrew. I really appreciate it. And I'm going to pivot us uh, just a little bit towards the downside of well-being where people are going to be in burnout. And I'm seeing, even though the pandemic is you know, not at its peak, now that I know so much about well-being and burnout, I see it in people all day long, literally an hour doesn't go by. And I'm curious how you see well-being in relationship to burnout. Yeah. Um, this has been a question that's been studied a lot in the context of psychology and organizational psychology, which is great. It means that it's not actually a new question and we have 30, 40 years of research to be able to stand on the shoulders of here. So um, one of the best researchers who has spent her lifetime studying um, studying burnout is, um, is someone named Maslach. 
And, um, and Maslach would say that there's probably like six major things that ultimately contribute to burnout. Um, the first, most importantly, is just workload. Like if there's too much on your plate and you can't create space for anything else, <laughs> like let's just stop right there, right? So we have to think differently about workload. Um, the second is perceived lack of control. Like we all have, well, not everybody, but most of us have this true human need for autonomy, for freedom, to be able to choose our own adventure in our lives. And if that's taken away from you, which the pandemic really took it away from us. I mean, it outside, right? Like all the external forces in our lives that took freedom of choice away from us, you know, compound that with all the things inside an organization, micromanagement, bad policies, all those things really can whittle away at our sense of being able to control things. Um, the third one is about reward and recognition. Like we, we want to be paid fairly. As I said, that's a really important thing, but it's not just about the money. We want to be recognized for doing a good job. We want to feel like we matter, like we're valued in an organization. So how do we create cultures of recognition, of gratitude, of, of positive feedback and not just constructive feedback? And poor relationships would be what Maslow would say is the fourth major driver of burnout. Um, it, I mean, bad relationships kill an employee experience. The relationship with your manager is one of the most important elements of, um, of, of engagement at work. Having a best friend at work, Gallup would say, is probably the number one driver of engagement. All of those things are so important. If we don't create the context where people can really have high quality connections and relationships with one another, where there can be trust in the organization, it's so easy for that to just whittle away at um, at, at our at our levels of of well being. The last two are fairness and values. Um, fairness, I think, kind of underpins so much of what all of this is about. Um, there's this wonderful psychologist, his name is Isaac Prolentensky, who says there is no wellness without fairness. Um, if you take away fairness, it's just impossible. <laughs> like that's, and I think that that's why when I think about well being, and I think about EDI they're the same thing. Like if you don't have a great EDI strategy, if you're not thinking about equity, diversity, inclusion, accessibility, um, you are not creating an opportunity for people to have well-being across your organization. You're just privileging a few. Mm -hmm. um, the last piece is about values, which is really about, do I get to do the work that I want to do in an organization? There's a lot of terrible jobs out there, terrible jobs that don't allow us to do good work in the world. So how do we make sure as best as we can, we are creating good jobs through a design perspective, but also making sure that we're thinking about the values of the people that we're working with and making sure that those are aligned or help them see the connection, make the connection, craft connections so that they see their work as a pathway to well-being. Thanks, Andrew. So I think you in some ways have really covered this, but for those organizations that haven't been embracing this idea of well-being and aren't thinking <laughs> this in this way, right? Why do you think they should care about this? Like what would what would you say is like kind of the the, the reason one, why they should care, right? I mean, it's so obvious, I think, to all four of us why, right? But what what would you suggest and maybe how they could start? Yeah. Well, I, I mean, I, I go back to a business case at the end of the day, like most of the people who are listening to this organization or to this podcast, I'm sure work in organizations where the bottom line is really, really important. And there's a ton of research right now that exists that proves the point that when people have well, high well-being, the organization performs better. I mean, that's true for sure at a business level. Um, there's this wonderful study that Josh Burson and Associates did um, over the last year or two looking at business outcomes. And like, it's really clear. I'm just looking at the stats. You know, when, when well-being, when good well-being programs exist, and by good, I mean the kind that are really tackling, rethinking kind of the organizational design from the perspective of well-being, like you're going to double your financial targets, you know, five times more likely to like have lower annual health healthcare claim costs, um, almost three times more likely to delight your customers. I mean, from a business perspective, it just makes sense. But from a talent perspective, I mean, it's insane. Like, like I mean, there's, there's stats to say basically 11 times less absenteeism when you have a strong, um, when you have a strong uh, well-being program, three times more likely to actually retain top talent, which 
in the context of the great resignation is everything. I mean, five times more likely to be able to actually recruit new talent. I mean, when you have a solid well-being program and that's part of your employee value proposition, like you are in competitive advantage when it comes to getting the best talent. So I think for those reasons alone, it's really hard to miss that this is an important thing to consider. That's incredibly compelling data. And I'm, a, I'm we, we, well, we're friends. So, you know, I'm a bit of a data geek. I like my numbers and my graphs. I, I would love to see that because I think I could put it to good use. Um, I'm going to finish up with a final question. And I, I so much appreciate your time. I, I work at multiple academic institutions and there's one, I won't name it, but they, this is very classic for people. They say they have transparency, but they don't. They say they have a well-being department, but it's really not. It's the equivalent of greenwashing. And the impact has been lots of gossip, a, a practical revolving door of attrition, but it's all really nice, good people. And it's, it's interesting to look at. So if you have an organization that is not going to change from the ground up, that it's just not going to happen, what sort of strategies do you think an employee could do where they're like, look, I'm stuck here for various reasons. I at the paycheck, the commute, whatever. I'm not leaving, but I don't like it here. What can I personally do knowing my little world around me will not change, but what can I change within me? Any mm -hmm. suggestions? Yeah. I, I think that, again, I said, there's a lot of really shitty jobs out there. Um, <laughs> and, and so I think this is a situation that a lot of people are in and, and, uh, and I, you know, I have a little bit of an ethical turn on this, just especially because I think you talked about greenwashing. Um, sometimes I talk about the say do gap. I think that there's a lot of organizations right now that are saying they care about well being, but it's super obvious they aren't. Um, and just as you said, I mean, attrition is going to be the answer. I mean, talk great resignation. I mean, if if you're in an organization and that's your truth good luck retaining your talent, especially your top talent. Like this is, this is, uh, you are not, you are not going to be making your, your stakeholders, um, happy in any way, um, with that strategy. So I think that there is, um, there's a loss that's going to happen there. Um, and I'm always a little bit cautious about, you know, recommending to people, uh, that, um, just ignore the realities that are in your life and, you know, try a meditation practice because, you know, it'll just allow you to kind of numb the pain of it and get you, get you through another day. I think that's actually a really dangerous thing. And I actually think that it's the number one thing that a lot of people do. And I think that meditation is great. Believe me, I don't think that there's anything wrong with meditation, but if you're not going to fundamentally change the work demands and you're just going to say to people, hey, build some personal resources um, to cope with these impossible demands that we're giving to you. I think it's a really unethical uh, decision that an organization is doing. Now, that's not the question you asked. You asked, as an individual, if I've decided I need to stay in this organization, and there's lots of reasons why we need to stay in organizations. I mean, a paycheck is a really good one. So if I need to stay in a job that is a shitty job, what do I do? Well, this goes back to that kind of Corey Keys model of like, there's a difference between well-being and mental illness. Um, I think that there's a whole bunch of skills that you can build, you know, things around mental resilience, things around making sure that you have an incredible social um, support community around you, um, different just ways of thinking about the ways that you think. There's incredible curricula that exists out there to help people build the kind of hope, the kind of um, self-confidence or efficacy, the kind of resilience and the kind of optimism they need to just get through really challenging situations. I've got a whole bunch on my website, so not making a plug, but just saying, if you want the kind of, um, you know, the greatest hits of positive psychology, from a resilience perspective, uh, you can go to eubd.ca and you'll see a whole resilience library in there. Um, they're all pretty easy to learn. And I think that's an amazing thing that positive psychology has given us is, is actually there's a whole bunch of interventions and skills and behaviors that, that we can all increase our capacity to withstand really hard things. And again, I think the pandemic has been proof in the pudding of that. Great. Thank you. And any final thoughts or a great question that we forgot to ask? Any final parting thoughts you'd like to share? No, I, I think I go back to the fact that um, 
the rewards for this are really uh, self-fulfilling. Like I, I talk about eudaimonia. I, I use this horrible word as the name of my of my company because I think that there's something if if this resonates with you, like if this idea of work can be a source of you know helping to bring the very best of yourself to do something important in the world. I think it's a really life changing way of thinking about work. And I think it, in, especially in the context of, of the kind of world that we live in today, you know, whether you're thinking about a social justice perspective, whether you're thinking an environmental perspective, whether you're thinking just about the kind of, the kind of communities that we want to be able to live in, um, it's really important to think about work mm -hmm. as a vehicle to help us do that. So that would be my, my parting request for anybody <laughs> listening to this. Um, Andrew, th this has been amazing. Thank you so much for your time today. We really appreciate you. Yes, thank you so much, Andrew. What a, what a great conversation. Thank you. It was wonderful. Great tips as well. Thank you. Thank you all. It's been a pleasure. We hope you've enjoyed this episode. If you'd like to hear future episodes, be sure to subscribe to the Happy at Work podcast and leave us a review with your thoughts. Are you interested in speaking on a future episode or want to collaborate with us? Let us know. You can send us an email at admin at happyatworkpodcast.com. And lastly, follow us on LinkedIn or Twitter for even more happiness. See you soon.